Chapter 47 Is that Chelsea Ryan? Emma asked as a female voice answered. The phone was on speaker so Ian could hear. Yes. Who is this? I'm calling from the Primary Care Trust. How are you? Okay, I guess. But I already told the other woman I don't want counselling. No, I understand. That's fine, Emma said. I'm just phoning to make sure you haven't changed your mind and to ask you a few questions about your experiences if you have a moment. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Emma glanced at Ian, and he gave her the thumbs-up sign. Did you or your husband ever attend the Moller Clinic? she asked. I don't think so. What is it? A fertility clinic. No, we don't need that. Thank you. Do you know if either of your parents attended the clinic? Not as far as I know. Do you want me to ask Grant? Yes, please. Emma took a moment to breathe again, as Chelsea shouted to Grant, Did your parents ever go to the Moller Clinic? It's a fertility clinic. No idea, he shouted back. Who are you talking to? Someone from the healthcare team. So I'll tell her you don't know. Yeah, and also tell them to get a move on with our compensation. Did you hear that? Chelsea asked, returning to the phone. Yes. What compensation is that? Emma asked, glancing at Ian. He looked as nervous as she felt. We're going to get compensation because the hospital lost our baby's body. We had nothing to bury, but I thought you'd know that. No, I'm sorry. I wasn't given that information. How upsetting for you both. I am sorry. What happened? Emma asked, fighting back her own emotion. She was cremated instead of being kept in the mortuary, Chelsea said. They're going to hold an inquiry. Grant found us a lawyer on a no-win, no-fee basis, so we're suing them for compensation. Grant wants the midwife sacked too, but I like Tan. And anyone can make a mistake. You're too bloody soft, Grant shouted in the background. Your midwife was called Anne, Emma asked. What was her surname? Long. Anne Long. She was lovely, really kind and caring. She just made a mistake. I don't want her to lose her job. Well, I do, Grant shouted. Anyway, what's that got to do with whoever you're talking to? Ian motioned to Emma to wind up the call. I'm so sorry for your loss, Emma said again. Thank you for your time. I hope you get what you want. Saying goodbye, she ended the call, then turned to Ian. Show me that spreadsheet again. What is it? He asked, holding the laptop between them. The second generation spreadsheet was still open on the screen. Emma was quiet as she looked again at the entries. You see those letters A-L beside some of the names? She said. They could be the initials for Anne Long. They're beside our names and Chelsea and Grant's and some others. About thirty of them. Could it be that Moller is making a note of the midwife some of us used? Why would he do that? Ian asked. And the others don't have any initials at all. If you're right, shouldn't they have the initials of their midwives too? A.L. could stand for any number of things. I assumed it was a medical abbreviation to do with infertility. What made you think of Anne Long? When she updated my antenatal notes, she always signed them A.L. It just struck me. I'm probably wrong. There is a way we could find out, Ian said, by phoning some of the others who have the same initials beside their names and asking them if their midwife was Anne Long. But before we do that, I think we should check the names on the spreadsheet with the patient folders. If the second generation are the grandchildren of Moller's patients, there should be a folder for their parents. We know our parents are there, and I'm sure I've seen one for the Ryans. Yes, Emma said. 
But before we do that, you should have something to eat first. You must be starving. I am, Ian admitted, and exhausted. It's been a very long day. Chapter 48 At 7.30 that Wednesday evening, Jan scooped up Tinder from where he was lying on the sofa and carried him upstairs and into her bedroom. She set him on her bed and came out, closing the door securely. Hopefully he would sleep and not chew things. She had let him out as soon as she had taken the video clip. Capturing them on film would be undeniable proof, not open to misinterpretation as a photograph could be. With a mixture of fear and anticipation, Jan returned downstairs. Not long to go now. She had been waiting all day for this moment, and yet, as it approached, she wondered if she was really doing the right thing. Perhaps it would be wiser and safer simply to leave the cottage and try to put all this behind her. But then, not knowing was likely to fuel her imagination and haunt her even more. She had seen something that couldn't be explained and needed to know what it was before she left. Going into the living room, Jan opened the curtains so the light from the room shone out over the patio. She went into the kitchen and gathered together the food she'd bought to entice them, then opened the back door. It was another cold but dry night. A crescent moon hung in a cloudless sky and the light from the living room fell dimly over the patio. She had switched it off once she'd finished. Jan began depositing little piles of food around the patio, not randomly as she had before, but leading from the outer edges of the patio to the window. Close enough, she hoped, that she'd be able to film them while they ate. For a moment, she was startled as she heard a noise in the shrubbery, but then a bird fluttered out. She quickly finished distributing the food and returned indoors, locking and bolting the back door. She checked that her phone was on silent. The camera flash wasn't on, and then, going into the living room, switched off the light. It was pitch black now. It took a few moments for her eyes to adjust, and she groped her way to the armchair where she took one of the cushions to sit on. She placed it on the floor behind the sofa to the far right of the patio window. Partially concealed by the full-length curtain, she had a clear view of the patio, where the food was most concentrated. From here she should be able to take a video without being seen. The most likely time for them to come was between eight and ten o'clock, so within the next two hours. She'd have to keep very still and stay in the same position for all that time. One movement, and they might see her and flee. She made herself as comfortable as possible, and held the phone ready in her lap. They wouldn't be able to see her unless they came right up to the glass and looked in. As soon as they began taking the food, she'd start filming, the infrared on her phone camera allowing her to film in the dark. Jan kept very still and waited. Tinder was quiet upstairs, hopefully asleep. The minutes passed and her breath came fast and shallow. Unable to risk checking her phone in case they were approaching and saw, she could only guess the time. She thought it was nine o'clock, not much later. It felt like nearly an hour had gone by, but it was difficult to tell. More time passed. She hoped it hadn't all been in vain. Perhaps they'd been watching her arrange the food and had guessed her intention. She thought they were intelligent enough. More time passed, and then Jan saw a small movement at the very edge of her vision. She didn't dare turn her head and risk being seen. Were they coming, lured in by the food, investigating or eating it? Would they follow the trail and come close enough to the window for her to film? Her heart raced as her fingers closed around the phone. She kept very still and concentrated hard. Another minute passed. 
and then she saw a small hand. She had to stop herself from crying out. So she hadn't been imagining it. Petrified but enthralled, she watched as it took a grape. Then a wrist appeared, lean like a child's but covered in fine hair. What was she seeing? It was taking food, but then the hand abruptly disappeared from view. Shit! Had she lost her chance to film? Jan kept very still, phone at the ready, willing it to reappear, but at the same time dreading it. A few moments passed, and the hand appeared again, and then an arm, covered by the sleeve of a jacket. Her heart beat wildly. He was turned away so she couldn't see his face, but he was the size and shape of a young boy. There must be children living feral in the woods like animals. There was no other explanation. She had discovered something incredible and alarming that no one else knew. Should she start filming now or wait in the hope of getting a better view? She was sure she'd only get one chance. Senses on full alert, Jan waited as he stayed where he was, turned away and eating. If she waited too long, she might miss her chance. She was about to raise her phone and start filming when out of the dark a girl appeared. She watched in horror and amazement as the girl joined the boy. She needed to start filming now or she would miss the opportunity. Adrenaline pumped through her as she slowly raised her phone, praying they wouldn't turn and see her at the last moment. Then... She was looking at their images on the screen and recording. Jan kept the phone as steady as her trembling hands would allow. They moved from one pile of food to the next. Closer now. Closer still. Then right up to the window. The boy looked in. Jan stifled a cry and kept filming. But he'd seen her. They turned and fled. Trembling, Jan pulled herself to her feet and came out from behind the sofa. She switched on the living room light and closed the curtains, struggling to calm herself. What had she just seen? She stood in the living room, gripping her phone. It contained the proof she needed, evidence of what she and Chris had seen. There was no pretending or denying they existed now. Trying to silence her racing heart, Jan played the video. The image was dark, but with the camera's infrared, they were clear enough to see. Two of them, childlike, taking the food and then coming right up to the window, looking straight at her. If she hadn't seen them with her own eyes, she would never have believed it. Children, but not like any she'd ever seen. She pressed play again and examined the clip more closely. Then she spotted something else and a new fear gripped her. Partially visible in the shadows at the outer edge of the patio was the outline of an adult. She hadn't seen it when she'd played the clip before and had been concentrating on the foreground. She played the clip again. It was certainly a person. Too indistinct to identify or even be sure if it was a man or a woman. Were they still out there? What did they want? She needed to call the police. At that moment, the front doorbell rang, and Tinder began barking from upstairs. Terror gripped her. She felt sick with fear. Keep calm and call the police, she told herself. Press 999. She was about to when her phone began ringing. The caller display showed Chris. What the hell? She pressed to accept the call. It's me at the front door, he said. Can I come in? What do you want? To make sure you're all right, are you? No. Well, open the door so I can help you. What made you come here now? You're not answering my texts? Could he be trusted? Did she have any choice? Chapter 49 Trembling, Jan opened the front door, 
just wide enough to be able to see it was Chris. Why are you here? she asked again, her voice unsteady. She kept one hand on the door, ready to close it if necessary. You didn't answer my texts, Chris said, looking concerned. I wanted to make sure you were all right, which clearly you're not. She stared at him, uncertain. When I arrived at the cottage just now, I found it in darkness. And why is Tinder barking from your bedroom? You look very pale. Are you ill? No, I've had a shock, Jan said. Was that you in the back garden just now? No, of course not. Is there someone there? There was. I expect they've gone now. Are you sure? Sure that I saw someone or sure that they've gone? Shall I come in and check? he asked. Jan looked at him carefully and didn't immediately open the door wider. Jan, it's me, Chris, he said. I'm not going to harm you. Whatever is the matter? She slowly opened the door and let him in. I'll check the garden, he said, taking the torch from its hook. He walked swiftly down the hall. You stay here, he called. No, I'm coming with you. Jan went after him, through the kitchen and into the garden. He held the torch out in front and swept its beam around the lawn and shrubbery. There was nothing to be seen. He went to the very bottom of the garden. She followed. My repair is still in place, he said, focusing the beam of light on the planks of wood that still covered the hole in the hedge. They can climb over things, Jan said, and saw his expression of incredulity. What can, Jan? he asked, and shone the torch around the rest of the garden. You said there was someone in the garden. There was. The beam fell on the food on the patio. I'm not surprised creatures are coming in if you leave food out, Chris said tersely. I wanted them to stay long enough to film them. And did they? he asked sceptically. Yes. She saw his expression change to astonishment and unease. Then he recovered. There's nothing here now, he said firmly. You look cold. Come on, let's go indoors, and you can show me the video you took. She went with him. As they approached the back door, he paused to shine the torch down the side passageway. That's how your intruder got in, he said. You've left the gate open. It was closed the last time I looked, Jan said lamely. Chris shut the side gate. Keep it closed and they won't come in, he said. He was taking this all too well, Jan thought. But he would struggle to account for the video clip. Shall I make you a hot drink? Chris asked as they went in. No, thank you. So where's this film? He was standing next to her as she pressed play on her phone. She watched his face, but it gave nothing away. Hmm, was all he said. It's rather dark. But you can see them, can't you? He nodded. Well, who or what are they? She asked and played the video clip again. I've no idea. I could ask Camille if she has any idea. Ask Camille? Jan exclaimed, astonished. Why are you trying to normalise what clearly isn't normal at all? I'm not. I've no idea what you saw. And what about the person in the background? Jan said, her anger growing. She stopped the video at that point and showed Chris. He looked more closely at the image. Perhaps it was Bill Smith from the village? He sometimes wanders after dark and could easily have come down your sideway. Let me have another look. Jan passed him the phone and watched his expression as he studied the image. Tinder was still barking. I'm going to take it to the police tomorrow, Jan said. Chris nodded. That's your choice. But can you let Tinder out now? He's getting very distressed up there. Jan went upstairs, annoyed by Chris's reaction. Here she was, showing him evidence of something incredible, and he was trying to rationalise it. She opened her bedroom door, and Tinder shot out and downstairs. 
By the time she returned, Chris was in the hall ready to go. I can't tell if it's Bill or not, he said, handing back her phone. I'll check on him on my way home. If he's not in, I'll let the police know. It's a cold night to be out. Are you all right to stay here tonight? Yes. Shouldn't I be? I've nowhere else to go at this time. You can stay with me if you like. I have a spare bedroom. No, I'll be fine, Jan replied stiffly. Give me a ring if you change your mind, and I'll speak to Camille tomorrow. I'm sure there's an explanation, and there's nothing to worry about. Once he'd gone, Jan closed and bolted the front door. What the hell was all that about? She couldn't believe his reaction, calm and rational, about something that defied logic. His response hadn't been normal. Either she was losing her mind, or he was, and she was sure it wasn't her. She had the proof she needed now, and tomorrow she'd take it to the police. The video was clear enough, wasn't it? Jan looked at her phone again to check, and went cold. The video clip had gone. Chris. He must have deleted it while she'd been upstairs. The bastard! There was only one reason for him to have done that. He hadn't wanted anyone to see it. But why? He had to be involved with whatever was going on. There was no other explanation. Chapter 50 It had been too late on Wednesday evening to start telephoning Moller's patients, so Emma took Thursday off work. Ian had already taken a lot of time off, and she could gather the information they needed just as well, if not better, than he could. She sat at the dining room table with Ian's laptop open in front of her, making notes. She had been very nervous to begin with, but with each call it had got a bit easier and being able to concentrate on something was helping. Most of the people she phoned were helpful when she explained she was asking for feedback on their healthcare experience. A few couldn't remember the details she needed, and some said they never took part in surveys, so she apologised and moved on to the next. It was time-consuming and emotionally draining. Often the parent wanted to talk about the loss of their child or grandchild and poured out their feelings. Able to identify with losing a baby, Emma found it upsetting and exhausting as she struggled to hide her own feelings. By midday, she had collected as much information as she could and was able to confirm that Moller's second-generation file referred to the children of patients treated by him although they had never been to the clinic themselves, and A.L. stood for Anne Long. In each case where Anne had been the midwife, the parents had suffered at least one late miscarriage, and sometimes more than one, as she and Ian had. Yet everyone spoke highly of Anne, kind, caring, dedicated, and showing great empathy for their loss. It wasn't her fault, they said. As a long-standing midwife, Anne would have delivered thousands of other babies in addition to those on Moller's list, Emma thought. This high neonatal mortality rate couldn't possibly be present in all her work, or she would have been investigated and stopped from practising years ago. It was worrying and didn't make sense. Why was this happening to Moller's babies when Anne was involved? What was going so badly wrong? Ian had said he would phone in his lunch break to see how Emma was getting on, and she now took the opportunity to make herself a mug of tea. She returned to the table and sipped it as she waited for Ian's call, puzzled and worried by what she'd found out. A few minutes later, Ian phoned, his voice sombre. Hello, how are you getting on? I've just finished. Without doubt, those listed on the second-generation spreadsheet weren't patients of Moller's, but their parents were, and A.L. does stand for Anne Long. I'll show you my notes tonight, but Ian, something else has come out of this, and I'm not sure what to make of it. What? he asked, 
anxiety obvious in his voice. According to Moller's spreadsheet, it seems that when Anne was the midwife, the babies never survived, and also she always took care of the disposal of their bodies, just like she did with David. Emma heard Ian's silence. Her discovery had clearly filled him with dread, as it had her. What are you thinking? he asked at length. I don't know. The couples were grateful at the time, but later some of them regretted they'd made the decision so quickly, like Chelsea and Grant. But it was too late by then. I feel very uncomfortable and sad about all of this. I mean, we didn't give it much thought either, did we? We were too upset, so when Anne suggested she took David away, we agreed. We didn't even say goodbye. No, but I think that was for the best, Ian said, remembering the glimpse he'd had of their baby. Do you think there's a connection between Anne Long and the Moller Clinic? Emma asked. It would seem so. Why else would Moller have her details? Maybe she's selling body parts to labs? There was that big scandal some years ago. Oh, Ian, don't say that, Emma cried. That's horrible. I couldn't bear the thought of David being in a laboratory. Hopefully I'm wrong, Ian said. Anne wasn't our midwife in your first pregnancy, and that went wrong too. I seem to remember we weren't allotted Anne for David straight away. The midwife was changed partway through the pregnancy. Yes, because we decided on a home birth, and she was more experienced in home deliveries. If you remember... The hospital tried to talk us out of a home birth and said they couldn't be held responsible. We had to insist. Then Anne came to our rescue. Ian was quiet again and then said, I think I need to speak to Anne face to face. Shall I ask her to visit us? The last time I saw her she said to phone if we needed to talk. No, I'll visit her. At the hospital? Or her home? Do you know where she lives? No, but I'll be able to find out. Oh, Ian, that's not a good idea. We don't want any more upset. We've had enough to cope with this year, and Anne hasn't done anything wrong as far as we know. Don't worry. I just want to ask her some questions. Chapter 51 Thank you for returning my call, Jan said to DC Matt Davis. You're welcome. Although, if it's an emergency, you should call 999. It's not, or rather it isn't an emergency now. It happened last night. I had another intruder come into the garden. Yes, it was Bill Smith. Really? Are you sure? Positive. He's safely home now. If you'd told the duty officer what your call was about when you phoned this morning... They could have reassured you then. I wanted to speak to you because you'd been here when it happened before, Jan said. No problem. Anyway, the mystery of your intruder has been solved. Where was Bill found? Jan asked. In Wood Lane. Chris Giles found him and phoned us in case anyone had reported him missing. I see, Jan said, wondering why Chris hadn't texted her to let her know. Well. I'm glad he's home safely. Yes. Was there anything else concerning you? Jan hesitated. She no longer had the video to prove her claims. You remember you saw those track marks in the garden? Whoever made them was here again last night, she said. They came right up to the window looking for food. They seem to be getting around, Matt replied lightly. A family in the village has reported seeing a strange figure, to use their term, in their home. Did they? Jan gasped. Yes, it gave them quite a shock. It seems it had come in through the window in the kitchen they'd left open to clear the smell of cooking. The couple's teenage daughter came down in the night for a drink. They heard a scream, but by the time they arrived, it had gone. So don't leave any windows open. No. I won't. Did the girl say what it looked like? Not really. She only caught a glimpse of it as it disappeared out of the window. 
Who's most likely a fox? Was there just one? Jan asked. Yes. Try not to worry. Just remember to keep your windows and doors closed. Chapter 52 It had been very easy to find Dan Long's address. Ian hadn't had to hack into a database. Her name and address were on the public electoral register for all to see. 45 Dells Lane, Melton, CP 291 DA. It was about three miles from Maryless. Ian was now driving there after work on Thursday, having first told Emma where he was going. She had tried to dissuade him, but he was determined. He had to go. He needed to know. If Anne was out, he'd wait a few hours and then return tomorrow. And every evening until he had the answers he was looking for. What was Anne's connection to the Moller Clinic? And why was her name linked to so many baby deaths? Ian was trying to keep an open mind, but it was becoming increasingly difficult. It was nearly six o'clock as Ian pulled into Dells Lane. It was on the outer edge of the village. A row of semi-detached houses lined one side of the road, with open common land on the other. The road was dimly lit by old sodium street lamps, which gave it an unhealthy orange glow. Ian drove slowly along the road, checking the house numbers as he went. Number 45 was the last. Most of the houses had a small driveway, so additional cars were parked on the road. Ian pulled into a space two doors up from Anne's, from where he could see her house. The house was in darkness, and no car was parked on the drive or directly in front, suggesting she wasn't home yet. He would check anyway. Getting out, Ian walked along the pavement, up the drive, and pressed the doorbell. He heard it chime inside and waited, but no one answered. He tried again, and then returned to his car to wait. It occurred to him that if Anne was on a night shift, she might not return until the following morning. He'd wait an hour or so, and then try again tomorrow. He turned on the radio and watched the minutes tick by on the dashboard clock. Half an hour passed. The car chilled, and Ian switched on the heater. He stretched his legs and texted Emma to say he was all right. He looked around, out of the side window to the common land, which was just grass and bare trees. He wasn't used to this level of isolation and stillness. It was very different to where he and Emma lived. In the suburbs, there was always movement, cars going along the road or neighbours in and out of their houses. Since he'd been sitting here, he hadn't seen a single person. At 7.30, with no sign of Anne, Ian decided it was time to call it quits for this evening. He straightened in his seat and was about to start the engine when a car appeared in his rearview mirror, having just turned into Dell's Lane. Ian waited. The headlamps dipped, and Ian watched the car's progress in the wing mirror as it came towards him along the lane. He was half expecting it to turn off into one of the driveways or draw up outside a house, but it kept coming. He ducked down low in his seat as it passed, then raised his head just enough to see out. It stopped outside Anne's house, but didn't turn into the driveway. The door opened and Anne got out. He could see her reasonably clearly in the glow of the street lamp, but her vision of him was blocked by the car in front. She was wearing a dark winter coat, flat shoes, and had a bag over her shoulder. He couldn't tell if she'd come from work or not. Ian watched her walk briskly to the front door, key at the ready, and let herself in. The door closed and the lights began going on inside the house. He'd give her a few minutes before he went to the door. Ian looked at her car, parked right under the street lamp. It was a grey Vauxhall Corsa, which he recognised from when she'd visited him and Emma. But he now realised he'd also seen it, or one very similar, parked outside the Moller Clinic on his last visit. It had been there when he'd arrived, but
but had gone when he'd left. If that car had been Anne's, which he was pretty sure it was, then she was the person with Moller when Ian had arrived and who'd left in a hurry. Why was she there? And what had happened to make her slam the door as she'd left? Time to confront her, Ian thought. He opened his car door, but as he did, he heard a whirring sound coming from Anne's house. He looked over and saw her garage door slowly rising. He quietly closed his car door again and waited, keeping low in his seat. The garage door rose to its full height, and a small navy van with tinted windows pulled out. It turned left down the lane, going past him. The garage door automatically closed. It had been impossible to see who was in the van through the tinted windows. The lights in the house were still on. Perhaps there was someone else living there. Ian wondered, although there was only Anne listed on the electoral register. Getting out, he went to Anne's front door again and pressed the bell. Silence. He rapped on the door. More silence. It seemed no one was in. So that must have been Anne leaving in the van, which was odd. She'd arrived home in her car and gone straight out again in a van with tinted windows. He ran to his car, quickly turned it around, and then sped down the lane after her. He thought he'd seen the van's indicator flash right before it had disappeared, and so he turned right, heading towards Melton. There was no van in sight. He continued along the main road that ran through the village, looking left and right, down the side roads, but there was no van. At the end of the village, he turned the car around and retraced his route until he came to Dell's Lane, where he turned in. He continued to Anne's house and tried the door again, but no one answered. Annoyed with himself that he hadn't spoken to Anne when he'd had the chance, he went next door to number 43 and rang their bell. A man in his fifties dressed in overalls answered. Sorry to trouble you, Ian said. I was hoping to see your neighbour, Anne Long, but she's out. Do you know when she might return? At this time in the evening, she's either working or walking her dogs, he replied. Oh, I see. Her car is still outside. In that case, she's walking the dogs. She takes them in the van. We keep well away. Nasty brutes by all accounts. She can only walk them at night when there's no one else around. Thank you, Ian said. Do you know what time she's likely to return? It varies. Recently it's been very late. I heard her garage door at nearly midnight yesterday. I'll come earlier tomorrow then. Thanks for your help. Chapter 53 If Chris thought it was going to be that easy to get rid of the video she'd taken, then he was very much mistaken, Jan decided. There was no other reason for him to have deleted it from her phone than to stop her from showing others, and especially the police. She couldn't imagine why he didn't want anyone to know, and also why he'd lied about Bill Smith being in Wood Lane, but it was very worrying. The more Jan thought about what DC Matt Davis had told her, the more worried she was. She was sure Chris had made up finding Bill in Wood Lane after he'd left her. Otherwise, he would have texted or phoned her to say he'd been found. The police had taken Chris at his word, but perhaps Bill had been home all the time, and Chris had simply checked on him as he told her he was going to. The other reason Jan believed Chris had lied to the police was that she was certain it hadn't been Bill in her garden last night. She'd seen Bill Smith wandering around the village, and he was a big man, over six feet tall with broad shoulders and a large stomach. Although the image in the video hadn't been clear, the person certainly wasn't tall and broad. They were much shorter, smaller and thinner. But why had Chris lied? Had he recognised the person in her garden and was covering up for them? There was no other explanation. Jan fully intended to take another video, if possible, that evening, and then go to the police with the full story. 
Now someone else had reported a strange sighting, she felt sure that, together with the video clip, her fears would be taken seriously. She could imagine the teenage girl's horror when she'd gone into the kitchen. The police were putting it down to an animal getting in, but Jan knew differently. Food seemed to entice them, and Jan would be using it again tonight. But she wouldn't be showing Chris her evidence this time. He couldn't be trusted. After she'd gone to the police, she'd call Camille and say she wanted to leave as soon as possible. Enough was enough. This was supposed to have been a quiet retreat to give her time to heal. It was anything but. At 7.30, Jan arranged the food she'd prepared around the outer edges of the patio, not close up to the window as she'd done before, then returned indoors. She shut Tinder in her bedroom and then downstairs again opened the living room curtains. Hardly daring to breathe, she put on her jacket, boots, scarf, beanie hat and gloves, and tucking her phone into her pocket, quietly let herself out of the back door, closing it again behind her. The light from the living room shone out over the patio. From outside looking in, it was obvious that no one was in the living room. They would be wary about being caught a third time, so she was using a different tactic tonight and showing them the room was empty. Struggling to believe she was actually doing this, Jan crossed the lawn to the shed at the bottom of the garden and let herself in. Thankfully, Camille had kept it reasonably clean. There were just a few cobwebs hanging in the crevices. She shivered from cold and nerves and pulled her woolen hat further down over her ears. Taking out her phone, she stood a little way back from the window and prepared to wait. From here she could see the living room clearly lit up. On a cold winter's evening, it looked warm and inviting. Despite being well wrapped up, the cold seeped into her. The shed was old and some of the wood had separated at the bottom, leaving gaps. A mouse scuttled past, but Jan had never been frightened of mice. 8.30 came and went. An owl hooted in the distance, and a light breeze stirred the barren branches of the trees overhead, making them creak and groan. Then she was aware of another noise. She stood perfectly still and listened. It sounded as though it had come from the roof of the shed. A scratching sound. Was it a branch chafing against the roof? She didn't think so. There it was again. Something was up there, more scratching as it moved across the roof. Her heart raced. It was too heavy for a bird, she felt sure. Then a small hand appeared at the top of the window. It was them. They were on the roof. Jan clamped her hand over her mouth to stop herself from crying out. Petrified, she forced herself to keep quiet and wait. The hand disappeared from view but the noise coming from the roof continued. How many were up there? She'd only seen one hand, but the noises suggested more. She looked up and tried to track their movements. Why were they on the roof and not going to the food? Did they know she was in the shed? Surely not. Unless they'd been watching her earlier. Fear gripped her. More scratching noises, and then it went quiet. What were they doing? Were they still up there? She was half expecting to see them appear on the lawn, running towards the food. She kept her phone camera at the ready and waited, but it went quiet. She listened, straining against the silence. Where were they? Had they gone? Suddenly she heard a movement at the door. Dear God! They were trying to turn the key and lock her in. Throwing herself at the door, she forced it open, just in time to get out. Without looking back, she ran up the lawn to the cottage and let herself in. As she did, she heard a woman's voice call from the woods, No, don't do that! The same voice she'd heard before. Fighting for breath, Jan locked the back door and fled upstairs to the spare bedroom at the back. Without switching on the light, she crossed to the window dialing 999 as she went. She could barely keep her phone still for trembling. 
but there was a torch beam in the woods. I'm Jan Hamlin. I live in Ivy Cottage, Wood Lane, she said as soon as she was connected. There are intruders in my garden again just now. I think they're in the woods. I can see a torch. Please come quickly. Ivy Cottage, Colshaw Woods, the operator checked. Yes. We'll have someone there as soon as possible. Stay in the property and keep your windows and doors locked. Yes, I will. Please hurry. Jan kept her phone at the ready, but as she looked, the torchlight disappeared. She had no doubt that by the time the police arrived, there'd be nothing to find, just like the last time. Chapter 54 A little after six o'clock the following evening, Ian pulled into Dell's Lane. He drove to the end of the road and parked a few spaces back from Anne's house, as he'd done the previous night. It had been raining most of the day, and although it had stopped, a damp mist hung in the air. Tinged with orange from the street lamps, it gave everything a ghostly hue. Anne's house was in darkness. Her car wasn't parked outside and the garage door was closed. Ian assumed she hadn't returned from work yet, so he'd wait in his car, just as he had the night before. Only this time, he'd make sure he spoke to her. According to her neighbour, she would return to walk her dogs at some point, for they weren't the type of dogs you could ask someone else to walk. Ian struggled to reconcile the Anne he and Emma knew, a gentle, sensitive midwife, with a woman who kept dangerous dogs. But then Ian would be the first to admit he was struggling with a lot of what he'd learnt in the past few days. At 6.20, he saw headlamps as a car pulled into Dell's Lane. He tracked its progress in the wing mirror, but it parked halfway down the lane. Not Anne, not this time. He blew into his hands to keep them warm and then turned on the car's heater. His gaze wandered to the common. The mist was thicker there, drawn to the damp soil of the turf. It hovered unnaturally in the frost-laden night air. Ten minutes passed, then another set of headlamps appeared at the end of Dell's Lane. Ian straightened in his seat and monitored the car's progress as it came steadily towards him. He ducked as it passed, then raised his head and watched Anne park her car in the road outside her house. He waited until she got out, then opened his car door. Anne, he called, walking swiftly towards her. It's Ian Jennings. Ian? Whatever are you doing here? She asked, shocked. I need to talk to you, he said, and followed her to her front door. She put her key in the lock. Why, is Emma unwell? No, but I have to speak to you. About the Moller Clinic. The colour drained from her face. It won't take long, he added. I have some questions. What about? She kept one hand on the door. You know the Moller Clinic and the work they do there. I've heard of it. I found out recently that both Emma's parents and mine used the clinic, and they were given the same donor sperm. Emma and I share the same biological father. It could be the reason we can't have healthy babies. Ian would have preferred to say all this inside, but it was clear Anne wasn't going to invite him in. How do you know this? Anne asked, turning slightly to meet his gaze. Carsten Moller told me. Eventually. Did he? she asked, surprised. Did he tell you who the donor was? No. He said it was confidential. Ian couldn't tell her he'd accessed the clinic's files. I am sorry, Ian. That should never have happened. It must have come as a huge shock for you and Emma, but I don't see how I can help you. I'd like you to tell me what you know about the clinic. Nothing. I was just aware of its existence. Have you ever had any dealings with Carsten or Edie Moller as a midwife? No. There's no reason for me to. So you've never come into contact with them? No, sorry, Ian. 
I'm afraid I can't help you. Now, I've just returned from work. I must have something to eat before I take the dogs out. Would you like me to visit you and Emma tomorrow? She turned the key and opened her front door. I'll ask her and let you know, Ian said. He returned down the path to his car as Anne let herself in. She was lying. Her name was all over Moller's files, and her car had been at his clinic. The expression on her face when he'd first mentioned Moller had been one of shock and possibly guilt. Anne wasn't a good liar. But what was she hiding? She'd been so warm and friendly when she'd been their midwife, but now she was guarded and hadn't been able to get rid of him quickly enough. Yes, she'd just come home from work and wanted dinner before she took the dogs out, but Ian hadn't seen or heard any dogs eager to be let out. He supposed they could be caged out the back, but wouldn't they have barked when they heard her voice? Ian turned his car around and drove to the other end of Dell's Lane. He parked between cars, switched off the headlights and prepared to wait. At some point, Anne would leave to take the dogs for a walk, and he would follow her and perhaps try again. He'd come here hoping for answers, but now he had even more questions. Some that he could barely consider and made his stomach churn. All those dead babies listed in Moller's vials with Anne's initials beside them. She must be involved. Could it be that under cover of darkness she was using her van to transport baby parts to laboratories for research? She would get paid a fee. Is that why she'd been so on edge and had lied? Or even more macabre, was she burying dead babies to cover up a crime? Ian shuddered at the possibility. At 7.30, Ian saw headlamps in his wing mirror coming from the far end of the lane where Anne lived. Was she in her car or van? He kept his head turned away as she passed. She was in the van. It stopped at the end of Dell's lane and indicated to turn right. The same as last night. Ian started his car, but waited until she'd pulled out and had made the turn before he followed. He kept a safe distance between them, so she wouldn't be able to identify him in her mirrors. The fog helped. It had thickened in the last half an hour, and sometimes... All he could see of her van was the red glow of the taillights. He followed her along the high road that ran through Melton and out the other side. They were now heading towards Merryless. Ian knew this road. He kept his distance and concentrated on the taillights. A little further along, Anne took the turning signposted to Colshaw Woods. Ian dropped back so she wouldn't become suspicious. There was only two of them now driving on this side of the road, with the occasional car coming in the opposite direction. Half a mile or so further on, she turned left down a single track lane. Ian waited until her tail lights had disappeared before he followed. The lane didn't go anywhere but into the woods. He had come here for walks in the summer as a child. It had been pleasant then, but now the mist and darkness gave it a sinister edge which added to his unease. He admired Anne's tenacity to come here all alone. But was it really necessary to come this far to walk dogs? Were they really that dangerous? Surely there were less isolated places she could have gone. Unless she wasn't walking dogs at all, but burying dead babies. In which case it would be ideal. Ian grimaced at the thought. Ian pulled over and stopped. The lane ran out shortly, so Anne would have to park before long, and he didn't want to get too close. Slowly opening his car door, he listened. He could hear an engine idling somewhere further up the track, just around the bend. He assumed it was the van. It stopped. From memory, he guessed she had parked close to the thickest part of the woods, but it was impossible to see in the dark and mist. Ian quietly got out of his car and stood very still, listening, senses on high alert. All that could be heard was a light breeze stirring the treetops. 
he needed to get closer to see what she was doing, but there was no moon to show him the way. Taking out his phone, he pointed it down and switched on the torch. Keeping close to the trees with the torch beam concentrated on the ground, he gingerly made his way along the edge of the track until he came to the bend. The outline of her van appeared, and he quickly switched off the torch, stepped back, and tucked himself behind the trees. As he watched, he saw Anne get out of her van and go to the rear doors. She was wearing a quilted jacket, Wellington boots and jeans, so looked dressed for walking dogs, although he couldn't see any leads. Ian stayed perfectly still and watched as she glanced around and then opened the rear doors. He stared in horror and amazement, unable to believe what he was seeing, as two little figures jumped out and disappeared into the woods. Not dogs, definitely not. They looked like children. Jesus, what the hell was Anne doing? It was worse than he could have imagined. Leaving the rear doors open, she went after them, disappearing into the dense woods. Breaking out in a cold sweat, Ian followed, moving slowly and stealthily through the trees. He couldn't see them, but he could hear them further up. They were in the thickest part of the forest now. They were a lot faster than Anne. He caught glimpses of her jacket through the trees a little way ahead as she struggled to keep up. They appeared to be trying to outrun her. Were they trying to escape? But who were they, and why were they here? What in heaven's name was she doing transporting children in a van after dark? Then he realised, and his heart missed a beat. She was trafficking children, selling them for money. That must be it. He couldn't think of another explanation. Pretending she had dangerous dogs, was she actually making money from the sale of children? He had to act fast to save them. Ian took another couple of steps, hiding himself behind the trees as he went after her. He'd rescue the children and then phone the police and let them deal with Anne. Suddenly a twig snapped under his foot. Shit. He froze hoping they hadn't heard. All movement stopped. The wood fell silent. Then Anne's voice called out, Who's there? Ian stayed where he was, hardly daring to breathe. His stomach churned and sweat trickled down his neck. Then there was movement from somewhere in the forest. Something was running towards him. He couldn't see what. He should get back to the car and phone the police from there. He turned and fled, ran as fast as he could through the undergrowth, out of the woods and onto the track. He could hear footsteps behind him, gaining on him. Then Anne's voice again, Stop! Come here now! He looked behind him, lost his balance, tripped and fell. Down, down, no time to save himself before his head hit the ground. Pain shot through his skull as the trees began to shimmer swimming in and out of focus. He tried to shout for help, but the cry died in his throat as he began to lose consciousness. The last image he saw before darkness engulfed him was of a small face looking down on him. Then nothing. Chapter 55 Jan stood at the open window in the back bedroom, her phone in hand, watching and listening. It was quiet in the woods now, not a sound. She'd rushed up here, hoping for a better view, one that would allow her to take another video clip, but it hadn't happened. She'd seen two torch beams in the woods, the same woman's voice, and then nothing. She wasn't going to call the police again. It would only be a repeat of last night. By the time they arrived, there would be nothing for them to investigate. And last night, she had got the feeling the officer they'd sent had thought she was wasting police time. Reluctantly, 
Jang closed the window and admitted defeat. She wouldn't be replacing the video Chris had deleted, now or in the future. This had been her last chance. She'd already telephoned Camille and said she was sorry, but she needed to leave the cottage as soon as possible, as she wasn't happy here. Camille had taken it very well, considering, and said she would book a flight straight away and would text her once she'd landed. Jan had agreed to stay until she arrived. She came out of the bedroom and went downstairs. Whatever was happening in the woods would remain a mystery. She checked the front and back doors were secure, and the electricity meter was topped up. Then she sat on the sofa beside Tinder and rubbed his head. She'd miss him but she couldn't wait to leave the cottage and live in the town again, where electricity was constant and there was no strange happenings in dark woods. As soon as Camille arrived, she'd be off. She'd already begun packing and felt ready to restart her life, apply for jobs, meet old friends, maybe even have another long-term relationship, if she could meet an uncomplicated, honest guy. Her thoughts went to Chris who had seemed so honest and straightforward at the start. Now she had no idea who he was or how he fitted into whatever was going on around here. She remembered the look on his and Anne's faces when she'd come across them in the woods, guilty, almost as if they'd been caught out. She stopped stroking Tinder and looked up. Of course, why hadn't she made the connection before? The woman's voice she'd heard in the woods was Anne's. She was sure of it. No wonder it had sounded familiar. But what the hell was she doing in the woods at night? Grabbing her jacket and keys, Jan let herself out of the front door into the cold, misty air. Hopefully she wasn't too late, and Anne was still there. Jumping into her car, she pressed the central locking system and switched on the side lights only. They gave just enough light so she could see where she was going without being seen. She drove as fast as she could along Wood Lane to where it joined the track leading to Colshaw Woods. She pulled over onto the bank, out of sight, then cut the engine and lights. Just in time. Headlamps on full beam appeared from the turning, flicking through the mist as the car bumped over the uneven surface. Closer and closer, growing brighter, then a small van appeared and turned into the lane heading towards Merryless. Jan couldn't see who was driving. Visibility was too poor, and the windows seemed to be tinted. But the rear number plate was lit. Jan made a note of the registration on her phone, then headed back to the cottage to report it to the police. Hopefully this was the proof that was needed to start a proper investigation. Chapter 56 Ian's eyes slowly opened. Where the hell was he? A light on the ceiling swam in and out of focus. God, his head hurt. Had he been in a car accident? He seemed to remember driving in fog. Then a voice close by said, You're awake. Anne Long came into view. Ian started and tried to sit up, but collapsed back, his head throbbing. Where am I? He gasped, his throat dry. What are you doing? You're safe. You're on the sofa in my house, Anne said. You fell and knocked yourself out. Shouldn't I be in hospital? He asked, trying to struggle up again. How long have I been here? Not long. You should be all right. It wasn't serious. Have a sip of water. She held a glass to his lips and Ian drank. Water had never tasted so good. What do you want with me? He asked, confused and frightened. Nothing. I brought you back here to recover. You can go as soon as you feel well enough. Why didn't you call an ambulance? There was no need. You're not badly hurt. She hesitated and set the glass of water on the table. What do you remember from before you fell, Ian? He frowned, trying to remember. 
it began coming back. I remember driving, following your van. It was dark. You turned off into Coleshaw Woods and parked. Jesus, you haven't got dogs. You're trafficking children. He struggled up and stared around. Where are they? What's going on? Where are those poor kids now? Calm down, Ian, Anne said, touching his arm. They're upstairs asleep. I'm not trafficking children. Far from it. You have to trust me. Trust you? You lied about knowing Castor Moller, and then you lock children in the back of a van and take them to the woods at night pretending they're dogs? You're evil. Sick. I'm going to call the police. He jabbed his hand into his trouser pocket for his phone, but it had gone. Where's my phone? In your jacket pocket over there. Anne nodded to where his jacket hung on a chair back. You can have it, Ian, but it's not in your interest to call the police. Whatever do you mean? She looked at him carefully. Ian, things have gone on that you have no idea about. Things you couldn't begin to guess at in your wildest imagination. And it's better for you if it stays that way. As soon as you feel well enough, you need to return to Emma, forget everything you have seen this evening, and continue your lives. That's not possible on any level, Ian snapped. Lowering his feet to the floor, he sat upright and faced Anne. The room tilted slightly. Emma and I can't continue our life together. We're half brother and sister. And I'm not taking your word for it that those children are upstairs asleep. Who are they? You told Emma you don't have children. I want answers, Anne. I already know a lot more than you think. I know you're involved with Moller and his clinic, and that the two of you are responsible for babies dying. No, that's not true, Anne cried, visibly upset. How could you believe that? I'm a nurse, a midwife. I save lives. Then tell me the truth. Anne was silent for a moment. Then, bringing her gaze back to Ian, she said, If I tell you, you must promise never to repeat it to anyone, not even Emma, especially not Emma, or you will regret it. Ian felt a rush of fear. I'm not making any promises until I know what it is you and Molla have been doing. Then, at least keep an open mind. Anne took a deep breath, as if summoning the courage to begin. Ian, you already know that you and Emma share the same donor, but do you know who it is? No. It's Carsten Moller. He is your biological father. No, he's not, Ian gasped. That's not possible. It's true, Ian. He is your and Emma's biological father, as he is to thousands of others, probably going back to when the clinic started. Ian stared at her, stunned, and felt sick to the core. But how? How is it possible? Both our parents were given details about their donors. Anne shook her head. He made them up. All the babies conceived by donor sperm at his clinic came from him. There were never any donors. It was all him. Ian stared at her and struggled to take in what he was being told. So that's why I couldn't find details of donors in his records. You've been able to see Moller's records? Anne asked. Yes, although he doesn't know. That's how I came to link you and him and the clinic. Your initials are beside some of the entries I've seen, and in each case it seems the baby was born dead. So that's why you thought I was responsible for babies dying? She asked, her face sad. Yes, aren't you? No, and they weren't born dead, Ian. He continued to stare at her. I haven't seen the clinic's records, but if Carsten has been putting my initials beside babies' names, it will be for those who were born alive, but with a life-limiting condition. I told the parents they were stillborn and took them away to save them the trauma, just as I did for you and Emma. Many don't live long. You what? Ian cried, his hand instinctively going to his throbbing head. I don't believe you. 
Why are you lying? I'm not. I'm telling you the truth. I did it to save the parents the agony they would otherwise have endured. Think about it, Ian. You caught sight of David just after the birth, and you were grateful I took him. You didn't want any fuss or an autopsy. You just wanted me to deal with it, which I did. But that's when I thought he was stillborn. It's different now. How? I saved you and Emma the pain and heartache of the truth. You wouldn't have coped. Remember the looks on the faces of the nurses who delivered your first baby? Emma told me the senior nurse managed to just about hold it together, but the younger nurse couldn't hide her shock. That would have been the reaction of everyone who came into contact with David if I hadn't falsified the records to show him a stillborn. Ian held her gaze, and he remembered the horror of that first birth, and that he and Emma had been grateful to Anne for taking David away and seeing to everything. He supposed there was some truth in what she said. If you're telling me the truth, then Moller is responsible for all of this. He's pure evil. But I don't understand. We're normal. We don't have any condition. The children born from his donor sperm are usually healthy, and the only giveaway is that they often look similar, as half-siblings do. The defects only began to appear in the second generation. Moller got away with it for years, tricking parents into believing they were buying donor sperm when it was him all along. But then some of their children began forming relationships with each other, as you and Emma did. It was inevitable with so many sharing the same biological father that this would start to happen. Unaware they were related, they began having babies, and that's when this condition began to appear. My God! And Molla did this for money? Maybe in part, but he and Edie can't have children, and he became obsessed with his line carrying on. He's very arrogant and believes his genes are superior. That's ironic, Ian said bitterly, when he's responsible for deformed babies. Except they're not deformed as such. Whatever do you mean? Ian asked, touching his head again. Anne paused. Have you ever heard of atavism? No, Ian admitted. It's the term for what is sometimes called a throwback, when a trait from our ancient ancestors reappears in the modern day. The most common example of atavism is the human tail. It formed part of the storyline in the film Shallow Hal. Ian nodded. I saw that film. Although rare, there are examples of atavism all over the world, including excessive body hair or fur, skulls shaped like Neanderthals, exceptionally large teeth reminiscent of primates, reptilian hearts and so on. It happens in animals too. These features are hidden deep in our genes and usually remain dormant, but can resurface or mutate. In the case of Moller, it happened because the babies of the second generation shared too much of the same DNA. Had you and Emma had children with a different partner who didn't share the same DNA, it would have been lost in the genetic pool and remained dormant. You would have had normal children. Ian shook his head in dismay. But why haven't you reported, Moller? To begin with, it was just a suspicion I had that something odd was going on at the clinic. I began keeping records of babies who'd been born with the condition. It took many years to build up enough evidence to confront Moller. He laughed in my face, said I was delusional, and then reminded me of the part I'd played in an illegal abortion. Some years before, a woman came to me, miscarrying after she'd tried to get rid of it herself. I helped her, and I should have reported her, but she begged me not to. She said her brothers would arrange to have her killed to save their family honour if they found out. I don't know how Molla knew. But if he had reported me, it would have put her in danger and been the end of my career. Molla promised he would stop what he was doing and use donated sperm. And think about it, Ian. What would happen to the infants if the news got out? 
they would be considered freaks. The press wouldn't leave them alone and neither would scientists. They don't live long, and I try to make their short lives as happy and comfortable as possible. I saw your car at the clinic. I've been there a few times recently. I wanted proof he'd kept his word and was now using donor sperm, as he'd promised. We argued, and I left. You left a review online, Ian said, remembering. Don't go anywhere near this place. They're in it for their own selfish ends. Yes, for what it's worth, Anne said wearily. I'm worn out by all this, the guilt, secrecy, lies, and trying to protect the children. But how do you know when one of these babies is going to be born? Ian asked. You weren't our midwife to begin with. If Moller knows in advance, he tells me. He agreed. It was one of the conditions for not reporting him. He notifies me so I can provide the antenatal care. Then I take the baby and look after it for as long as necessary. It's difficult, working as well, but specialising in home deliveries gives me flexibility. How many are there? Ian asked, still struggling to accept what he was being told. I have three at present. That's the most I've ever had at one time. Sometimes I don't have any. The numbers fluctuate. Some of them only live a few months, others years. Her eyes filled. They are my children, Ian. I love and care for them, and when they die, I mourn their passing. I pray for them and bury them in Colshaw Woods. Is that why you were in the woods tonight? No. We go there for a walk. They can't be seen, so have to stay indoors during the day, but they need fresh air and exercise, just as all children do. I take them in the van after dark to the deepest part of the forest, where they can run and play freely. There's nowhere else for them to go. And they really are upstairs now? Yes, I'm telling you the truth, Ian. They'll be asleep, worn out. They're like children, just different. They can be very mischievous sometimes, but they mean no harm. They love to run and can move very quickly. They can't talk, but they understand in different ways. They like to have fun. I can't always keep up, as they're too fast. I live in dread of them being discovered. A couple of times, when they've run off into the woods, it's taken me hours to persuade them to come back. My neighbours believe I have dangerous dogs, which keeps them away. But there's a tenant in Ivy Cottage, which backs onto the woods, who knows far too much. I think she's heard me calling them, and she's been encouraging them into her garden with food. Ian fell silent as he tried to come to terms with what he'd been told. He was still struggling. So they're genetic throwbacks from our ancient ancestors, he said at last. Yes, although I prefer to call them outsiders, as they live outside the human race and animal kingdom. Ian fell quiet again, then said, I suppose I should thank you for taking David and looking after him. When did he die? He hasn't yet. Your son is still alive. Chapter 57 Ian held his head in his hands as the room spun and a buzzing noise filled his ears. He thought he was going to faint. David is still alive? He asked incredulously, finally looking up his voice far off and unreal. Yes. I left him wrapped up warm in his car seat in the back of the van while we took our walk. He's asleep in his cot now with the other two. They're a little older. I love them all for the short time they're with me. Am I doing wrong? Ian shook his head in despair. I really don't know. I can't take all this in. I wish you hadn't told me. It was easier not knowing. Who are the others? The boy James is the son of a single mother, Lydia Wren, and the daughter was born to Grant and Chelsea Ryan. I saw their names on Moller's list. Emma spoke to Grant and Chelsea. 
Why? Anne asked, immediately anxious. Because we were trying to establish what connection they had with the Moller Clinic? I see. Mr. and Mrs. Ryan don't suspect anything, do they? No. If they found out, they would sell their story to the newspapers. They're already suing the hospital for compensation because their baby's body disappeared. So you took her from the hospital? Ian asked. Yes. I had their permission at the time, but then they changed their minds. I've called her Keris. It means love. She'll miss him after he's gone. Gone? Gone where? Ian asked. When David passes, I mean, Anne said quietly. He's going to die soon? Ian asked, shocked. A few months. Anne's eyes filled again. The gene mutation that gives them this condition means they mature more quickly and at different rates. It's very evident in Keris, but it also shortens their life expectancy. I know it's nature taking its course, but each time one dies, it's harder for me. I look forward to a time when there are no more being born. I shouldn't have pressed you to tell me, Ian said remorsefully. I don't know how I'm going to deal with all of this. You don't have to. You can go home and let me deal with it, just as I have been doing. I doubt that's possible. Now I know I can't just walk away and forget. What other choice do you have, Ian? He sighed. I've no idea. I can't share it with Emma, that's for sure. She'd never cope. It's better she believes David was born dead. Anne nodded solemnly. And you've told me everything now? Ian asked. Yes, there is nothing else. I'll go then, he said, standing. I need to think about all this and then decide what to do. Put it behind you, that's what you do. Go and get on with your life. Ian took a couple of steps towards the door and stopped. Does David look like me? Yes, he's definitely your son, Anne said. She paused and then asked, Would you like to see him before you go? There is nothing to be frightened of, and it might help give you closure, show you he's not the monster you imagine, but a child in need of love and affection, one who won't be with us for much longer. Ian hesitated, and then gave an imperceptible nod. Yes, he replied quietly, it might help. Anne stood and led the way upstairs. Ian followed, full of trepidation and misgivings. Was this really wise? Shouldn't he do as Anne had first suggested and leave now, and get on with the rest of his life as best he could? Would seeing David really help or make it worse? He honestly didn't know. They came to a halt outside a bedroom at the rear of the house. The door was bolted from the outside. Is that necessary? Ian asked, concerned. Yes. I daren't give them the run of the house in case someone sees them at one of the windows. The glass in the window of this room is opaque, but the others aren't. It would only take one sighting, and that would be it. Ian watched, his heart thumping as Anne slid the bolt and slowly opened the door. A small nightlight cast a pattern of stars and a moon on the ceiling. It was like the outside come in. Ian followed Anne into the room. There were two small beds and a cot, a chest of drawers and a changing station, much as you'd find in any nursery, Ian thought. Only, of course, this wasn't any nursery. This is David, Anne said, quietly going to the cot. Ian went over and stood beside Anne as she leant over the side of the cot and adjusted the cover. He looked at the sleeping form, curled on its side, with a blanket loosely over his body. Only his head was visible, and one little hand that clutched the corner of the blanket. The back of his hand was covered in a fine down, so was the top of his head, but there was none on his face or neck, as there had been when he'd been born. His features were more like that of an ordinary child, too, now, as was the outline of his body. 
After a few moments, Ian found he wasn't experiencing the repulsion he'd thought he would, as he had with the birth, but compassion. David stirred in his sleep, and then turned onto his back. His lips moved and his eyelids fluttered. Was he dreaming? Ian wondered. If so, about what? Are you all right? Anne quietly asked him. Ian gave a small nod and continued to gaze at the sleeping child, his child, although not like other children. A throwback from the ancestral past, or as Anne preferred to call them, an outsider. A child who should never have been born and would never experience the joy of living with his parents, playing, having friends or going to school. A child who hadn't long to live. Ian swallowed hard, and slowly extending his hand, reached out. He lightly touched his son's forehead. It felt warm and smooth, not cool and rough as he had expected. He touched David's hand, which was still clutching the corner of the blanket. That too was soft and smooth, despite the fine down. The little fingernails were all perfectly formed, although Ian noticed his thumb was shorter than that of a normal child. David's eyes suddenly flickered open, and Ian quickly withdrew his hand. He stared up at them, startled and confused. It's all right, Anne soothed. There's nothing to be afraid of, love. This man won't harm you. He understands, Ian asked incredulously. A little, combined with my facial expression and tone. Babies do. Say something. Talk to him. But don't make any sudden movement, as it frightens them. David? Ian said softly. The child looked at him. Are you all right? He looked back. Do you have everything you need? Are you well and happy? The brightness that came into his eyes suggested he was. I'm so sorry, Ian said, his voice catching. Sorry for you being like this. If I had any idea this could happen, I, I would never have had children. David looked back with something that looked like sadness in his eyes. I'm your father, Ian said but there was no response. He doesn't understand, Anne said. He has no experience of a father. They just have me. Leaning into the cot, Anne said, This man is good, a parent like me. He loves you. She touched Ian's arm to show David she approved of him. David's expression lightened. I think he knows who you are, Anne said softly. So do I. Ian said, and a tear escaped down his cheek. He was looking at the child he'd never thought he'd have, and he could never share it with Emma. It would be too cruel. And Moller was to blame. That man needed to be punished. And at that moment, Ian vowed to do it, for David's sake, and for all those like him, whatever it took. <laughs>